name is Liz Falk with Cornell Garden Based Learning. Feel free to learn more about us at our website at gardening.cornell.edu. There are a lot of free resources there for you to download, including information about starting and sustaining a school garden project, including some tips on fundraising. Also, there's free lesson plans and curriculum available to you on all sorts of different topics. For today, we'll be talking about choosing and starting seeds for your People's Garden school project. We will be referring to, very briefly, the implementation and beyond the guide that is downloadable at the People's Garden website. And if you haven't yet downloaded this guide, you'll want to go ahead and do so and have a look through this. Today we'll be talking very briefly on page 22. On page 22 in that guide, you will see some information about the USDA plant hardiness zone map. It looks a little complicated at first, but it's quite a simple map that you can input your region, um, city, or, or town, and you'll get a specific number about the zone that you're in. That zone helps you determine your region's average minimum temperature. This is just helpful information to know when you start gardening. You can read more about it in your implementation guide, but I did just want to mention it here. Once you know your USDA hardiness zone, you'll be able to also figure out your first and last average frosts. These are important things to know before you start choosing plants for the garden. Then you want to think about the kinds of things that are relatively easy to grow. Most annual plants that are commonly eaten by many of us are pretty easy to grow from seed. Some of the things that tend to be a little harder are broccoli, cauliflower, corn is another one. It often requires a lot more space than our school gardens have to properly pollinate. So corn is something fun to grow in the garden, but it's not always one of those plants that you actually get a great harvest from. So great things to grow in the garden are beets and radishes and peas and beans, tomatoes, peppers, eggplants. There's a very long list of your general annual veggies that are, that are easy to start from seed. You'll want to think about the kinds of things that will be ready to harvest during the school year, both before the school year ends and once students come back after their summer break. Of course, if there's a summer program at your school, thinking about the kinds of things that will also be ready to harvest in the summer. Think about things that are tasty to eat. Students might be picky and they'll certainly learn to try things they don't think they like and realize that they actually taste pretty good when they grow them themselves. But trying to stay away from some of the things that have a really strong flavor. Example I, I list here is fennel or some of those mustard plants. But certainly be open to what the students say that they like and think about the kinds of things that they might be willing to try. And that especially those things that are, are really good for them, like leafy greens. Try to think also about having some diversity in your garden. Not only planting, planting annual veggies, but also thinking about fruit. Uh, you could plant berries if you have the space. Even fruit trees are a wonderful addition to a school property. Herbs, both medicinal and culinary, they also are really just great to touch and smell, get all those sensory sensory um, sensory senses going on for the students. They really like to smell them and taste them. And of course flowers, flowers for beauty and for, for attracting pollen. Hi, my name is Liz with Cornell Garden Based Learning. Today we're going to talk about how to start seeds for a school garden. So to start we have potting soil. You can Make a big container of potting soil, something that's clean, like a Rubbermaid container, and you want to just make sure there's not any big clumps in it. Break those up before you start. Have your seed tray ready. You can also use things like um, old yogurt containers with, with holes in the bottom. You can be creative about the kind of seed tray that you use to start seeds. It doesn't have to be an official tray like this. Then you take a pot or a scoop kind of container and just lightly fill up the entire tray or your containers that you're going to start your seeds in with potting soil. What you'll notice about this potting soil is that it's dry. Right now it's not wet at all and you'll see that there's white little seed, um, little pieces in it and that's a sign that it is potting soil. These little white pieces help keep air into the soil and help the soil retain water once the seeds are all planted. 
Once you've poured some potting soil into your tray, just level it off a bit, and then you're ready to plant seeds. So now that we have our seed trays filled with potting soil, which is dry, we're ready to start planting seeds. Today we're going to be planting basil, it's called Genevieve's basil, and mammoth sunflowers, both great plants to have in your school garden. There's a couple ways to plant seeds, and I'm going to talk about two today. Everybody has a different way, and there's not always a wrong way or a right way. You'll find a way that works best for you, but I'll talk about two that I think are good to do with youth. The first method is to wet your soil slightly, and just ideally wet it a little bit, maybe with a watering can, and then take a either your fingers or these are the pots that are the same size as what's in my tray here and press down the soil a bit. That allows everything to settle and it gives me a little space above the soil between the soil and the top of the seed tray. In this method I find it my hands get sticky and so it's not good for younger children I don't think. It's also not great when you're working with really small seeds. Um, for Something like sunflowers, you can see, and you probably know the seed pretty well. The seeds are big, they're easy to handle even with, with wet fingers. Now, basil seed though, I'll show you some basil seed for comparison, is quite small, almost the size of a poppy seed. And I find with wet fingers, it's very difficult to hold the basil seed in my hand. I don't recommend using gloves. I do think it's important to touch it and be able to feel the soil with your fingers. But to plant basil seed, we'll be using this dry tray over here. So we'll just put that off to side for now, and we'll start with the sunflowers. So to plant sunflowers, I like to put a few seeds in, my, in one of my hands, my non-dominant hand, so you can give the youth a couple seeds, maybe four or five. And these are really easy to pick up, grab in, one other, in your other hand, place it in your soil right on the top. Since we've made this, um, this dent down into the soil, we have some space here. So we put about one seed, two is not a big deal, two is fine, in each, right in the center of the container that you're planting in. Now you might wonder how I know how deep I should plant this seed. General rule with seeds is that you plant it about double the depth of the size of the seed. Sunflowers are pretty big, peas are also pretty big, so that's an easy one. Some of the smaller seeds, it's hard to tell. So the great thing about planting seeds is that if we look at the seed packet, it tells us almost all the information that we need to know. So once we've planted this whole tray of sunflowers, we take our little pot of soil on the side, and then I just cover up the seeds. I like this method with youth because I find it really allows the teacher or the garden volunteer to help press down the soil and make sure you're going to have the correct planting depth for your seed. So that's method one, planting sunflowers. Just to finish this method up, we do want to be sure that we take a label. I put the date on it. It's April 18th. I put sunflower and the variety. So I wrote down mammoth sunflower. And then these are done with one final step, a final watering. So we'll just water everything we planted nice and fully. And then those will be all done. The second way to plant seeds is in dry soil. I find this method a little more challenging with young youth, but a preferred method for adults, for high school students, college students. I like to take a dry tray of soil. I've looked at my basil, and it tells me that my seed planting depth is a quarter inch. It's not very deep at all, so the challenge is making sure you're not planting too deep. Once I know that I want to plant a quarter inch, I take my dry marker or your dry finger and put a little hole inside each planting cell, about a quarter inch deep. Take some of those seeds into my non-dominant hand, and then here I'm going to try to get at two seeds per cell because one is kind of difficult. One or two, if you end up with three or four, it's not a problem. We'll thin them out later, and we'll talk about that later in this in this PowerPoint webinar. So we put one or two soil uh, seeds in each hole. 
we finish them all, we go through the whole tray. Then we just take our soil that we moved off from the side and cover it up, fill in those holes, push down a little, kind of like you're putting them to bed. We grab our label, again the date, basil as the herb and the type of basil, Genovese. Stick that in the tray and again we water. You'll want to be sure you water your seedlings at least once a day, sometimes twice. You want to keep the, the soil moist all the while while they're growing. So there are your two methods. I, can, I suggest practicing both, seeing what works for you, what you like. Good luck. To take a little moment to go into detail about the seed packet, when you are starting to plant things, even if you're new or you're not new to gardening, it's always helpful to read a seed packet. And each company will have different information on their packet. But just to go through some of the common things that you'll see on a packet, the ones that you want to pay attention to. The type of plant, whether it's an annual or a perennial. Annuals, they grow once, they produce fruit, or they produce their product and then they die. Perennials will come back every year. So this is will be important to know if you're planting perennials that you give them the space that they need to, and you make sure you don't cover them up through the winter or pull them out. You'll want to know the planting depth for the seed. The general rule is to plant it about double, about double its size. This can be hard with the really small seeds but generally the range is somewhere around a quarter inch to one inch. Seed packets will tell you if a plant needs full sun or full shade. Sometimes it's a little symbol that somewhere in the middle a, a filled in sunshine symbol might indicate that it can handle partial sun. Approximate height, of course, that the plant's going to grow to. Days to germination is sometimes on the packet. If proper conditions, it might say seven days to germination. Direct sow, it's the time of year that you can directly sow these seeds into the ground outside. Some examples you might see on a seed packet are a certain number of weeks before last frost, or a certain number of weeks after last frost, or as soon as soil can be worked is a common phrase on a seed packet. And that simply means as soon as the soil is warm enough to move around the top couple inches with your, with your hands pretty easily. It doesn't mean that uh, frost is not going to come again, but for some plants such as peas and radishes and beets, that's fine if they get frosted once they're planted. Most seeds, but not all, you can also start inside, kind of jump start the season. And some of the things you'll need to do this with if you're in one of our cooler USDA zones, such as New York is or um, Washington State, you'll probably find the same thing. You'll want to start some of these tomatoes, melons, peppers, the fruits that's the fruits that really need a lot of heat to produce. You'll want to start them inside. And a seed packet will tell you four to eight weeks before last frost is a good time to start those inside. Some seed packets also tell you when the plant comes into flu full bloom or full harvest time. So always check out your seed packet. Don't be afraid to grow things you haven't grown before because the seed packet will often tell you exactly how to get it started. Once you've started your seeds, you'll want to think about a couple things for caring for them. Give them a warm location, ideally about 75 degrees. You don't need any fancy greenhouse or anything, but some warm spot in a sunny self-facing window is great or under grow lights in the classroom. You can start seeds on a radiator as well, but you do want to ensure that they're not getting too hot and they will dry out pretty quickly on top of the radiator. So you'll have to keep them, you'll have to keep watering them a little more often. Uh, you'll want to keep seeds moist, trying not to get, not to let seeds that are starting, plants that are starting to grow, dry out completely at all. Give them water at least once, usually twice or even three times a day if it's a warmer, sunny spot. You want to make sure that they're not getting soaked and really wet like a dripping sponge, but kind of feeling moist like a sponge feels after you've wrung it out. You'll then want to thin all your seed starts when needed. And thinning is a, is a simple process. It removes extra plants and gives room for one specific plant to get the nutrients it needs and to have the root space that it needs to grow to its full form. Thinning is done when plants are both started inside and, and is often done when plants are started directly outside in the garden as well. 
What you generally do is try to plant one or two seeds into your soil, whether it's in a seed starting container or in the ground, but it's definitely a tough thing to do sometimes with those small seeds. So we do need to thin them out to give more space to that one we really want to get to grow and harvest from. When you do thin plants, you can eat some of them as microgreens, things like beets, arugula. Most of the leafy greens are great to eat when they're in a small micro form. You can make a little salad with the students if you'd like. Some people do try to save and transplant the plants that you're thinning out. I find it to be challenging and not always worth the time, but certainly you're welcome to give it a try. You'll want to look at all the plants growing in your seed tray cell or in the area that you're about to thin and choose the one that looks strongest, that looks like it's sturdy and, and growing well and healthy, and that's the one you're going to want to keep. For all the others, you're just going to take a small little scissors and snip away any extra plants. Then you can use those in your microgreen salad. If you do try to transplant them, you're going to need to pull them out by the roots, and one of the reasons I don't recommend this method is because you'll also disturb, you're likely to disturb the roots of the plant that you want to keep. So you can try different things and see what works for you, see what works for the students that you're working with. Once you've thinned your plants, they are going to need to sit for a little while longer to get a little bigger. You usually want to thin when they're pretty small, just when they have their first two little leaves. Once they have their there are true leaves, at least two to six of true leaves, then you can transplant those plants outside as long as the, the temperatures are right. So for many things that will be after. So in conclusion, or just wrapping up what we've gone over today, you'll want to know your hardiness zone and your first and last frost dates for your gardening season. This can shift every year, of course, but getting your general first and last frost dates. Choosing seed types that your kids are going to like. You want them to be trying the things that they're growing in the garden. Planning for watering, planning for warmth for your seeds as they grow. Certainly be taking the time to be patient and just observe how the seeds grow. They all grow a little differently when they start to sprout up above the soil and as they get their leaves and grow bigger. And taking the time to really look at those, looking at the differences and how these plants form is pretty amazing. Thin extra seedlings to give room for a couple strong ones to grow nice and big and, and of course have fun and enjoy the whole process.